All right, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off here. So good morning and thank you all for joining us today for our March webinar presented by the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative in collaboration with the University of Minnesota Extension. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Caitlin Wilson. I'm the Education Program Specialist at SFBC. Um, and for those of you who recently registered, uh, if this is your first webinar this year, just a reminder that if you've registered to be here today, you're now registered for the entire 2021 series. So you'll receive connection instructions um, each month to your inbox. Uh, if you have issues with some of our emails going to spam or anything like that, we also post the connection instructions, the link to this Canvas page here. So you're welcome to uh, join from there as well. You can bookmark that link and then that way you don't have to search your inbox for the connection instructions each month. Um, also, since registering for one webinar gets you the whole series this year, if you've already requested and received CEs for a webinar uh, this year, you're good to go. So uh, we'll still drop the link at the end. Um, so watch for that, but you'll automatically be re redirected to that form when you exit the webinar as well. So unless something changes, like your the credit type you're requesting or your email address, uh, you only need to request your credits once this year. Um, next month, uh, we'll be hearing from Klaus Putnam and Al John Allendinger. So we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, they're gonna be joining Eli Sagor for a conversation about how foresters and ecologists understand the systems that we work with. So it's gonna be a little different. Um, last I heard there were not gonna be PowerPoint presentations. It's gonna be more of kind of a, a moderated uh, talk show approach with Klaus Putnam and John Allendinger. So join us for that. I think it's gonna be really great. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat right now. So you can check out details there. All right, so we also have another woods work session coming up next week. Uh, we'll be learning about the Minnesota Natural Resource Atlas, and you can check out that event here. We hope that some of you will consider joining us. And now without further ado, um, I'm really excited to introduce Monica Chandler from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, who's going to be discussing biological control of leafy spurge and spotted knapweed in Minnesota, and Sasha Lodge, who's the Forest Invasive Species Program Coordinator with the Department of Natural Resources. And She's going to discuss the current status and future plans of the forestry's weed uh, biocontrol program. As always, we're going to be recording the webinar um, and it'll be posted to our website probably by some time this afternoon, if not tomorrow morning, and you'll all be notified by email when that's available. Feel free to drop questions into the chat throughout the webinar. I'll be gathering those as we go and they'll be addressed at the end. And with that, Monica, the stage is yours. Good morning. Thank you. I'm excited to talk about biological control of leafy spurge and spotted knapweed today. Um, weed biocontrol is my favorite part of my job. It's really fun and interesting to work with. So thank you for this opportunity. Let's see. All right. So when we think about um, weed biocontrol and what we're trying to achieve, uh, we're working under this enemy release hypothesis. So in the native range, many plants that are invasive here are no problem in their native range. And that's because there are insects and diseases that keep them in check. So what you can see as an example is common tansy in Germany on the left. And you can see that there are some scattered plants here and there. So they're the green plants with the yellow flowers. And you can see some scattered plants. But then when tansy was brought to North America, it no longer has the insects and diseases that keep it in check and it can really run rampant. And what you see at Camp Ripley on the right is a monoculture Monica, of common tansy. Yes. Your, your slide did not change on our screen. Okay. Um, thank you for letting me know. And let's, all right, are we in business go. now? Yeah, we are. Okay, so now, <laughs> to, thank you. Um, so you, here you can see on the left, the scattered plants compared to the monoculture on the right. So what we're trying to do with weed biocontrol is reunite the target pest, the, the target weed in this case, with um, natural controls from the native range. So this falls under the heading of classical biological control, in which case we're reuniting the two in order to achieve control. 
so to bring um, insects or in diseases, insects are used more than diseases in biocontrol because um, it's easier to conduct this host specificity testing that is so important. So um, in order to bring in uh, an insect from another country or continent, um, it's really important to do testing. And this is primarily for two reasons. We're testing to see whether or not the insect will attack non-target plants. And we're also looking to see how effective this insect will be. So in order to have a really effective biological control agent, it needs to be really hitting that target. So there are different levels of host specificity testing. So um, the most, the most um, rigorous testing is no choice. And so what you can see is an example. So this is common tansy biocontrol development that you're seeing. This work is being done in Switzerland. And so what you can see on the top left is a set of petri dishes with a tansy leaf and then an insect is put in there. And so data are collected on whether or not the insect will feed on the leaf, whether or not it will probe it, or if the insect will die and just not, not feed on the, the leaf. Then um, if the insect appears to be uh, fairly host specific, so, um, you know, will only appear to be attacking the target plant, then um, choice testing is done. So if you put tansy into a container, like you see in the middle, a screened container, and then put in some other plants with it, uh, what will that insect do when it has some choice? And then um, finally, uh, there's a common garden experiment. So that's what you see on the far right is a set of uh, garden beds and they have tansy and they have a number of other plants in there. So when the insects can freely move about, what will they do? And so you can see why this work is being done in Switzerland. Um, is So then you're in the native range of tansy and these insects so that if there's escape, there are no um, issues with that. So before they're brought into the US, there's this very rigorous process of testing and then USDA approval is needed. Um, this is really different than what used to happen with uh, things like the Asian lady beetle that were brought over in the early 1900s and released and there was no need for any testing. So um, you'll be glad to know that uh, testing has become standard. So when is biological control useful? It's not useful in every situation. It's really best for large, stable, undisturbed infestations. It can be a great tool for environmentally sensitive areas where you may be hesitant to use a herbicide, or it could be used in, as part of an integrated program where maybe a single method of control is just ineffective, or if an infestation is really large, it may be too costly. Um, biological control can certainly be integrated with other methods, and that is often recommended in order to get best results. And once biocontrol is in place, uh, it provides long-term sustainable management, which is a real advantage of it. So first we'll talk about leafy spurge biocontrol. So leafy spurge is native to Eurasia. And um, as you can see, it can form these dense colonies. You see the yellow flowered plant on the right. So it, it just forms these monocultures in grasslands. And there's an underground root system that can send up new shoots. And so leafy spurge can reproduce both by seed and by uh, underground roots that send up shoots. So it can colonize an area relatively quickly. And it's pretty hard to control with herbicides because of this underground root system that's really extensive, it's pretty hard to get herbicide to translocate throughout that whole root system. So we use uh, beetles, Apthona species, predominantly Apthona lacertosa is the main species that's used in Minnesota. 
And so there's one generation per year, the female adult beetles will lay their eggs at the base of the spurge plants, and then the larva will tunnel down and, um, and feed on the roots, the leafy spurge roots, and that's where they will overwinter. And you can see it looks like some squiggly worms on the far left, and those are beetle larvae feeding on leafy spurge roots. And then uh, the beetles will pupate in the early summer and emerge as adults at the end of May um, on into June and in far northern Minnesota into uh, early July. So you can see the adult beetle in the middle. And then on the far right, that's a really high density of beetles on a leafy spurge plant. So these are pretty small beetles. You can see it looks like a lot of them dotted along that those spurge plants. And boy, when I see that density of beetles, it's really exciting because that means that's a really, really good time to collect right there. So speaking of collecting beetles, what we do is we harvest them using sweep nets. So we sweep the vegetation and then we put them through a sorter and the sorter has a mesh screen. And so what we're trying to do is um, sort out things that are larger than the leafy spurge beetles. And then you can see in the bucket on the far left that, that the whole bottom of the bucket is just covered with these spurge beetles. We quickly scoop out uh, using a vial, we do a, a volumetric measurement of the approximate quantity of beetles. We certainly don't count each one. Then we dump them into food containers that can then be uh, put into coolers and shipped overnight so we can move them around pretty quickly throughout the state. If you uh, would like to request leafy spurge or spotted knapweed biological control agents. The point of contact is your county agricultural inspector. So, um, so there's an ag inspector in almost every county in Minnesota, and there's a list of them on the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's website. You can find a list and find your county agricultural inspector and request biological control agents, and then they can work with me if they are not able to um, obtain agents in their county. And that's pretty common, that often there are a few sites that are really booming throughout the state that tend to be distributed throughout. So what kind of results do we get? They can be really, really exciting. You can see here a big decrease in leafy spurge. Uh, what you see on the left, is a high density of spurge. And then it was actually just three years later, this is an island site, and it, it really cleaned up quicker than I expected. And so on the right, you can see there's very little spurge left. So um, the results can be very dramatic. Um, then Success is achieved when you have a low level of spurge and a low level of beetles and they just cycle and they just find that harmony and keep each other in check. Spotted knapweed biocontrol works fairly similarly. We use um, different biocontrol agents obviously, but uh, there are a lot of similarities. So spotted knapweed is also native to Eurasia, and it can form these large, dense monocultures in grasslands. Um, it gets the name spotted knapweed, so it's the purple flowered plant that you see in the, in the image. And on the left, you can see why it gets its name spotted knapweed. You can see the brown black tips to the bracts, which are right below the flower petals. And you can see those tips, and that's how it gets the name spotted knapweed. So spotted knapweed is an herbaceous, short-lived perennial. It forms a rosette the first year, then bolts and sends up a flowering stalk. And um, it's actually really hard to photograph the whole plant of spotted knapweed. So I put a few in here to get a feel for what it looks like. And often it grows as kind of a clump, which is what you see in the bottom center. We predominantly use two biological control agents, seed head weevils that feed on developing seed and root weevils that um, develop in the roots of spotted knapweed. 
So seed head weevils, the adult female will lay her eggs on the flower and then the developing larva consumes the developing seed so that there's no little to no seed that's viable that's left in there afterwards. And then the, the weevil will pupate in the seed head and will emerge and you can see an exit hole in the lower right. There's one generation per year and the adults overwinter in the duff layer. Root weevils are really interesting. They develop in the roots of spotted knapweed and then emerge, they pupate in the root and then they emerge in the summer as adults. One generation per year and they often are very hard to find. They hang out on the spotted knapweed plants. Root weevils are really effective at controlling spotted knapweeds. So seed head weevils will control um, the amount of seed production, so they're controlling reproduction. And then root weevils will control spotted knapweed plants themselves. They can kill spotted knapweed plants by consuming the plant resources. And, um, and so the plant becomes very weakened by having those uh, weevils in there, and so a lot of spotted knapweed plants die. And so what you can see here is this infestation receding that, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry, the, um, what you see is the infestation receding where the spotted knapweed um, plants the release had been done towards the front center of this picture. And you can see that the, the spotted knapweed plants are just kind of killed off. And it, there can be these large circles formed um, around where the release sites are. And let's see, um, I have to, Let's see, it wasn't advancing. Okay. So again, results can be very dramatic for spotted knapweed decrease. You can see on the top, you can see on the left, you see Tamarack National Wildlife Refuge, a monoculture of spotted knapweed that was reduced over a period of about 10 years to what you see on the right. And then on the bottom left, it's um, gray cloud dunes, scientific and natural area, and then on the right about three years later, you see that level of control. And the difference was really the size of the infestation. It just took a lot longer to clean up a larger infestation. So um, weevils are collected often by hand, which is takes a long time. It's fairly tedious and they can be hard to find. We use these containers, soda pop bottles with the top cut off, inverted, and um, then we can transfer from the collection containers into these food containers and again, ship them throughout the state. You can integrate biocontrol with other methods like prescribed fire, using spring burns, um, treating with chemically treating uh, satellite populations and doing biocontrol releases in the it can work really well to use these different methods. When thinking about where biocontrol would work best, often you're looking for large undisturbed areas. So roadsides can be really tricky. Uh, this would be a better site because it's a lot less disturbed. It's an old gravel pit, but there's not a ton of knapweed in there. This is a great site. There's a ton of knapweed. It's an old gravel pit and it's owned by the county who can make sure that it remains undisturbed. Biocontrol data are available in EDMAPS. So you can, you can search for the specific species and you can uh, look at individual reports of releases. And with that, I would be happy to turn this over to Sasha. And I need to stop sharing. There. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Monica. Um, let me see if I can get my screen going.
All right. So um, thanks, Monica, for that great background on our uh, biocontrols that we're talking about today. Um, I'm the coordinator of the invasive plant management on state forest lands with the DNR. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how DNR forestry is using these biocontrols agents. So we have, um, sorry, working on too many screens here. There we go. Um, DNR Forestry has been managing spotted knapweed using biocontrol weevils dating back to at least the uh, early 2010s. And we have not yet done any releases of leafy spurge beetles, but we are planning to do some of that in the future. So we are always looking to reduce our dependence on herbicides. So when we can find sites that it makes sense to use biocontrol instead of depending too much on herbicide, um, we like to try to use that other method for species control. So um, one place where we've done a whole lot of knapweed control is at the General Andrews Tree Nursery and Fire Training Center in Willow River. So back in 2014, um, my predecessor and the folks at General Andrews released a whole bunch of root weevils. So this is a aerial photo and all these little pink dots you see are where they released um, batches of root weevils. So there's a lot of spotted knapweed on this site um, that's located especially along the roads and the edges of the planting beds. But some of these planting beds are um, haven't been used for a little while. So, for example, this area in particular, there are here we go. This area in particular, um, these are planting beds that have just been left open. There's nothing planted in them at this time, and there is a whole lot of knapweed. So, in this area in particular, um, we found that in the time since these weevils were released um, in the early 2010s and again late 2010s, uh, the weevils have flourished. So in early July of last year, uh, Monica and I and a couple other folks went and visited this location and we saw a lot of evidence of weevil activity. So what does that actually mean? It's a little bit hard to see in this photo, so I've tried to circle some of these, but these are all dead knapweed stems. So what Monica showed earlier, those knapweed plants, um, there's dead stems in each of these circles and this gray area back here is more of these dead stems. Um, and these dead stems indicate that the root weevils have established. So they're burrowing into those roots as larvae and killing the plants, which is great. Uh, we also saw a lot of seed head weevils. So the flower in my hand there has probably half a dozen of those little weevils on it. Um, and that was actually fairly common when we were walking around the site. And you can see some dead stems that also have those exit holes out of the flowers that flower heads that Monica mentioned earlier. So that's where the seed head weevils consumed the, um, the seeds in there and therefore they're preventing the seeds from spreading. Um, as Monica mentioned, these seed head weevils are good at reducing the seed production, but they aren't necessarily going to kill the plants. So it's those root weevils that we're really interested in. And so in that same visit at General Andrews, we dug up a plant and sure enough, there's a larva of a root weevil in there and it's burrowing and eating through that root. So that stem, well, if we hadn't pulled it out of the ground, was probably going to be dying sometime soon, which is great. Um, and we even did find a few of these root weevils on our visit, although we were there a little bit early in the season, the knapweed was just starting to flower. So it's likely that if we had shown up maybe two weeks later, we would have found more of those root weevils up on the flowers where we would have been able to see them and potentially capture them. So we are now thinking of this area at General Andrews as an insectary, so a place where these weevils are flourishing and we can depend on them to, to be reproducing there where we can go and collect them in the future. So that's, that's our plan there that the General Andrews staff are going to leave those two planting beds undisturbed um, so that the weevils can continue to 
grow and reproduce. And then we're planning to go and collect weevils in the future um, to be able to take them to other sites. Uh, at General Andrews, they're also planning to do some of that integrated pest management by spraying herbicides along the roadsides to limit the further spread of knapweed throughout the site and beyond the site. So this is one of those times where it makes sense to leave the knapweed undisturbed in one area so that we can foster this growth of the biocontrol agents while controlling it using a different method using uh, pesticides in places like along the roadsides where the biocontrol would have a harder time spreading and containing the population. So I mentioned collecting weevils and bringing them to other sites. So where would we do that? Um, what type of other sites? So as Monica mentioned, those old gravel pits are good, have good potential for biocontrol sites. So this is an old gravel pit in Finland State Forest, um, a little ways east of Hibbing. And it uh, has some pretty dense areas of knapweed. And um, what's important to note about this gravel pit is that it is inactive. No one is harvesting gravel out of it or planning to in the future. Um, and so that makes it a good candidate for biocontrol. For our active gravel pits um, on state forest land, we control the invasive weeds, the noxious weeds in those areas using pesticides to make sure we are actually eradicating them to prevent the spread of those noxious weed seeds with gravel to no, new locations. But if we're not harvesting gravel out of that area, then it makes sense to not depend on those pesticides and to release biocontrols agents to be able to reduce that knapweed population, but we're not concerned with whether the knapweed is actually totally eradicated. It's okay to have a continuing small population, we just don't want it to be so overwhelming that it's impacting the site or spreading to other sites. So with this gravel pit in Finland State Forest, um, we actually ordered our root weevils from a insectary in Montana. Um, and they actually sent us some bonus seed head weevils too, which was nice. Um, but we ordered them because we weren't sure what the status of the weevils at General Andrews was at the time. And because of COVID, we weren't able to get a group of people together to go collect weevils ourselves. So we figured we'd get somebody else to collect them for us and ship them to us. So one of our foresters, uh, John Splinter, released about 500 root weevils at this old gravel pit um, last August. And the plan is uh, to go monitor the knapweed population and the weevil population, um, possibly this summer or definitely next summer. And what does it mean to monitor that? Well, we'll go and look at how much knapweed is there. So we'll be looking for those dead stems that indicate that the root weevils have established and repro they're reproducing and therefore burrowing through those roots and then killing those stems. And we'll also look to at the weevils themselves. So if we're walking through the site, are we seeing seed head weevils on the seed heads? Are we seeing those root weevils hanging out up there too? Um, and that how many of those are we seeing? So that will give us an idea of whether those weevils have established um, or whether we need to do another round of weevil releases. So if that's the case, our plan is to collect some from General Andrews and uh, drive them up to, to the Hibbing area and do another release. So that's the type of thing we're doing with the spotted knapweed. Um, and we also have some plans to control some leafy spurge. Um, this is a red pine stand south of Brainerd. So in this photo, you can see this rectangle of state land. Um, and the stand I'm talking about is this yellow hash marked stand here. Um, and I'm gonna just zoom in here a little bit. So the stand is bigger than this photo, but this area in red is what our forester for that area, Carla Sandstrom, she, outline that polygon to indicate that um, that is the area that's infested with leafy spurge. So there's a lot of leafy spurge. It's about 11 acres and it's pretty dense. So actually most of what you're seeing in this photo um, 
is the flowering leafy spurge. And there's a few things interesting about this site. One, that it's a pretty large area of spurge infestation. And um, another thing is that the pesticides that we could theoretically use to control spurge, things like perspective and method, those are pretty harsh on trees. And so in this stand where we care about this timber, um, we don't want to apply as much pesticide as we would need to control the spurge population because we'd likely be killing our pines and that would defeat the purpose of doing this management in the stand. So that's one reason why biocontrol is intriguing for us. The other reason is the ownership boundary here. So this spurge is on state, state land, but it also extends over the fence into the private land, into this neighborhood. And if we were to do a management like pesticides or even something like prescribed fire, um, you can only do that on your own ownership. But biocontrol, if it were to be released here and establish, could naturally spread into the population that's over in the private land here. So we'd be able to actually be controlling the population on both sides of the fence line, which would limit how much reinfestation we'd get if we were to have just controlled it on our side of the fence. So that's a nice perk of biocontrol is that it doesn't respect um, boundaries. One other thing to note about this site is that there is a, a thinning planned in the next five or 10 years. And we've asked the timber program to um, allow that to happen during the winter months to prevent the or limit the amount of spurge seed that is spread by on the logging equipment throughout the site and to other sites. Um, just because we know that it's unlikely that our spurge beetles will uh, really knock back this population right away because it will take some time. So there's still going to be a fair bit of spurge on this site. And so we want to make sure that we're not spreading it further by our management activities. So if we do the thinning in the winter, that can, you know, spurge won't be as prevalent at that point. If we have some snow cover, things like that. So that can limit the amount it's spreading. <coughs> Excuse me. So this site is on Monica's list for releasing um, some spurge beetles uh, this summer. It was on last summer's list, but COVID prevented the collection and release. So we're hopeful that that'll happen this year. And we're really hoping that this can be a demonstration site for DNR forestry for doing uh, leafy spurge control. So we hope that we'll be able to do some field trips and show folks that at some point in the future. Um, and I uh, just wanna add that if there are DNR foresters on this call who have ideas for sites that might be good for biocontrol um, for spotted knapweed or leafy spurge, uh, feel free to drop me a line because we are always looking for more opportunities to, to try different methods for managing our invasive species. So with that, thank you all. And I'll turn it over to Caitlin to manage our questions. Thank you both. Um, that was great. I, since we've got some time, I can give some context for, you know, I, I invited Sasha and Monica to present because uh, I was actually out on a field visit. Um, Eli was there as well last fall uh, with some foresters who were talking about biocontrol um, that they had used successfully. And I had only ever really heard of um, like purple loosestrife examples uh, from my undergrad and grad school. That was always kind of like the keystone example of it. And I just had no idea that this was something that was, you know, commonly used and that you could just, you know, kind of order some bugs and send them out there to do some work. And I was, I was excited to hear some more. So I hope that this was, you know, as useful to the rest of you as it was to me. Um, so we did have a few questions. Uh, so the first one, if the weevils do really well, won't they eventually kill off all the host plants? And Sasha, this came in while you were presenting, um, but either one of you. Let's let Monica answer that one. I think she she could. Sure, yeah. So I have I have the long-term uh, history of working with biocontrol. I started working with it in 2000 and Sasha just started with DNR, what, a year, year and a half ago. So if we want to take this long view of uh, what happens over time with these uh, plant and insect populations, um, no, they do not kill off the weed. And actually that creates a whole interesting 
conundrum because, um, okay, so what they do is they reduce the, the target weed to what, what, what is an acceptable level. And so you have scattered plants here and there and you have some uh, beetles or weevils depending on which um, target species you're working with. And then uh, they just maintain and they maintain at that low level. And so sometimes like I've had farmers call me where they've, they've had infested pastures and with like leafy spurge and they'll call me and they'll say, oh no, I need more beetles. The, the spurge is coming back. And so we'll go out there and sweep and we see there are beetles there and say, okay, you know what? We're just going to leave this. It's all fine. It's just kind of cycling. So, um, so that's what happens is you just get this low level plant, low level insect, and it just stays in place and it works unless you have a big disturbance that might kill off um, your bioagents. And that can happen too. And so um, <clears throat> a lot of farmers really want to manage these weeds really intensively. And so our land managers in general, people managing natural areas, like if they see the spurge going way down and there are just a few plants left, they're tempted to go out and spray those plants. And I have to like hold them back, like don't do it because then you're gonna, your, your biocontrol will no longer be in balance because your beetles will die off if they don't have those host plants. And um, there's still a seed bank there, a considerable seed bank. And so you're gonna get a resurgence of spurge and you don't have beetles. So oftentimes you're really trying to get people to just walk away uh, as a management tactic. And that can be really, really hard for good land managers to do. Great. And um, so the individual to ask that question um, messaged and clarified, they were, their concern was in the insectary specifically. So do those sorts of things still apply in the insectary? Yeah, um, that's okay. I see. So yeah, we keep moving around to new and different infestations. So DNR will probably exhaust that area. Even though there, there's a lot of napweed there, <laughs> we have some <laughs> before we exhausted at at general Anders, But yeah, great. Um, so next question: Is there research on the effect of snow cover or winter temperatures on survival of the biocontrol agents? Um, there has been some research, but uh, probably the biggest evidence that these these um, biocontrols do fine is they can they are thriving throughout the state with all different temperatures so uh, we've seen consistent establishment great okay um would you compare plateau and mazapic hopefully i said that right to the two herbicides you mentioned for leafy spurge sure so um i mentioned perspective and method and actually perspective I don't think is being made anymore so that's probably irrelevant um, but method and plateau are both herbicides that DNR forestry does use to control um, spurge um, method is very toxic to trees and as I understand it plateau is less so but I'd still be careful around some of those pines um, so it they're both, those are two chemicals that, that can be effective to control leafy spurge. It kind of just depends where you want to be using them. Great. This one, uh, Monica referred to tests involving tansy. Have any biocontrol agents been approved for tansy? No, they haven't. Um, this has been a really long process. It was started in, I think, 2006, and several candidates have been ruled out as not sufficiently host-specific. <clears throat> and then some, some candidates are going through multi-choice testing now. Great. Um, what other terrestrial invasive species are being studied for biocontrol? Ground vetch, maybe? Um, <clears throat> there is a whole, there was a biocontrol summit, which really went through all the different, at least, um, plants that are being tested or that there's development for biocontrol. So it's a really long list. Um, maybe we could send out a link to the biocontrol summit. Yeah, 
That would be great. I can share that too um, when the with the recording on the page. Can I can um, I just throw in some yeah. random thoughts? So, yeah. um, I mean, there has been some testing for garlic mustard biocontrol that I think is sort of there's been some promising things, but there's that's sort of in regulatory limbo as well. Um, there's been testing for biocontrol of uh, buckthorn, which is something that would be amazing if we could have, but that is not looking promising at all, um, in part because there are native buckthorns. And so we run into issues where um, with some of that choice and choice testing that Monica mentioned and sort of host specificity that it's likely that a lot of those biocontrol agents that those insects that would happily eat uh, buckthorn, our common buckthorn and glossy buckthorn also happen to eat the native buckthorn. So that means that we don't actually want to import them because that can mess with our native stuff as well as the things we're trying to control. So that's a disappointing one because we would love to have some biocontrol for buckthorn. But it's one of those things that folks often ask, you know, are we working on that? There's been work on it for a long time and not not looking so good. So those are just some some of the forest species that we're working on or maybe not. Yeah, good ad, thank you. Um, so I've got could, two more here. Go add ahead. one thing to that because I'm so glad Sasha brought up uh, garlic mustard biocontrol. So there is one weevil species that was approved for release in Canada and they have started releases. And I don't know that they've recovered populations, but they have seen feeding damage, which indicates establishment. Great. So I guess I've got two more here, folks. So we've got more questions. We have time. So please feel free to continue to put those into the chat as they come to mind. Um, so next question, do you need to notify the neighbors on private land before releasing biocontrol insects? No, you do not need to notify the neighbors. Um, these are not regulated within the state. Okay. Perfect. Um, and then finally, can you comment on bird's foot trefoil control in native grass or flower area? That is not my area of expertise. There is a really good um, database called the Midwest Invasive Plant Control Database, where you can look up different methods and see how effective they are one year after release, or not after release, after uh, application. Okay, great. And I'm just, I'll get that link if you have that. Um, I'll make sure I have the right one, I guess, <laughs> before I share that with everyone. Um, so another question just came in. Uh, what is the likelihood of a private landowner, one, getting approval if approval is needed for spotted knapweed, two, getting the actual beetles, and three, if it is possible to get approval and beetles, what is the cost? Four, what can we tell landowners about likely effectiveness? So that was a lot. It is in the chat there. Um, so if you need to refer back, I'll paste it there again. <laughs> okay. And Help me out, Caitlin, and make sure, please, that I address all of those questions. Absolutely. So the, the first one was, uh, can private landowners utilize weed biocontrol? And the answer to that is yes. I would say most weed biocontrol is done on private land. Uh, the cost is nothing. So it's free. Um, we do request that we can come and collect beetles. So this is just a shared resource throughout the state, public and private lands. And there was another question in there, uh, yep. which I think so I second, didn't. So we've covered getting approval and, and cost. Um, I think it's just the kind of the process of getting the actual beetles okay. and then what they can tell landowners about likely effectiveness. Right. So um, it would the site would have to be appropriate for biocontrol. So the first step is to contact your county ag inspector and um, and there's a list of county ag inspectors on the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's website. And um, talk with your ag inspector. Maybe your ag inspector would be willing to come out and take a look at the infestation and uh, see how extensive it is. Is it in a disturbed area? Um, is it appropriate for biocontrol? And if it is, then your ag inspector could work with other ag inspectors or me to try and help get um, 
weevils or beetles to the infestation. I will say that we get more requests for spotted knapweed biocontrol agents than we can fill. So um, that can sometimes be a lack. And there are, um, so DNR Forestry has purchased spotted knapweed weevils. Um, so there are some places that, that you can do that. Um, um, I want to say off the top of my head, it was like $150 for a hundred of them or something like that. That's, that's kind of ballpark price. Um, and that was getting them shipped in from Montana. So it's also an option if people want to get them from elsewhere. And those, because we're, you'd be working with a in, insectary business elsewhere, they have the appropriate paperwork that's necessary to bring it into the state. Great. So I don't see any questions left now. I'm kind of curious to hear from folks in the audience um, if they've used any of these or, you know, if, if they have anything they can add about effectiveness they've seen on their own forest lands. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in. So while we address those, if you want to respond and say anything about your use of biocontrols, you know, I would suggest sending it to all panelists and attendees since we've got a few minutes. I'd be curious to hear. And in the meantime, we've got two more questions. Um, is it a hassle to move leafy spurge beetles across the border to Wisconsin if they can't find them in their state? Um, it used to be, uh, it used to be that the interstate movement was regulated by USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine. So that's a mouthful. Um, so you, you needed what was called a 526 permit. Uh, that's no longer needed for the interstate movement of leafy spurge and spotted knapweed insects. Um, but uh, usually if there's, so we're less likely to fill requests for individual landowners in Wisconsin, but if there were like state coordinators that wanted to come collect, um, that would be something that we could do where they might be working with multiple landowners if we had a good site for collection. Perfect. Um, if DNR Forestry has purchased beetles, then do we go straight to you for treatment or still through county inspector? DNR folks should come to me. Um, that way I can coordinate requests to, to MDA to, and also that we can help do with some of those collections too. Um, so yeah, DNR forestry folks, definitely contact me instead of your, we'll, we'll work with the county folks too, but go through me. Um, and someone's curious about where to find beetles for purple loosestrife control. So purple loosestrife biocontrol is overseen by DNR's aquatic invasive species specialist. So there's a list of them on a DNR site website. And, um, so there are different regional aquatic invasive species specialists. So they're the point of contact, but usually at the time when spurge is, or sorry, loose strife is biocontrol is happening. They have so many things on their plate that they may not be able to get to it. You could also ask your county ag inspector about purple loose strife biocontrol. They may or may not have a connection to a collectible site, but they're always, they're just a good resource in general to go to. Caitlin, I think you're muted. Thank you. I was just thanking you, Sasha, for dropping that uh, link to me. So there's a link to the aquatic invasive species specialist. Like I was saying when we started this morning, <laughs> it still happens. Um, and we have had a couple people respond saying that they have released uh, biocontrol. So we've had um, weevils released in the Hibbing area after a timber sale. They haven't made it back out yet to look for a sustaining population. And they're wondering when's the best time of year to look for the beetles. So this is it, this is for spotted knapweed biocontrol, or maybe I'll maybe I'll just do both because maybe uh, I'll just cover it all. So for leafy spurge, um, oftentimes I like to get out there. This is before beetles have emerged in mid-May, and I look for a lot of dead leafy spurge stems. And if I see a lot of dead stems, I know that there's a thriving beetle population there. And then I, if this is like a large site that looks like it's going to be good for collection, then I might go back once a week, really trying to 
to see when the beetles are starting to emerge and then maybe when they're more likely to be at peak density. Um, so that, that would often happen um, in the southern part of the state. Uh, peak density could start in early to mid-June and then continue up until maybe late June. Um, that might be getting a little late for the southern part of the state. And then I just work my way northward. And then uh, collections continue in the more northern areas into mid-July, maybe even late July in some of the far north areas. And then for um, to find the seed head weevils, you can look for exit holes on the um, old seed heads. So that's something I've done even like this time of year. You can look and see if you can find exit holes and that could give you an indication of whether or not seed head weevils are there. But if you, the easiest time to see them is when spotted knapweed is just starting to flower. So what they do is they cluster then on those opening flowers. So they're, they're not as scattered. They're like really concentrated on the first flowers that are opening. So that's the best time to get out there and look. And so that's often um, late June into early July for when those first flowers are starting to open up. Um, and then root weevils are later and they are just generally hard to find. Um, they often hang on right below the, the flower petals and with those spots on the spotted knapweed and the pattern on the root weevils, they blend in amazingly well and they can be very still and they can be sneaky and they can drop to the ground and they can blend in with kind of the dirt, the gravel. Um, so they're just generally hard to find, uh, but they, they tend to emerge in early July and then they continue to emerge into September. So up to about the first frost. Uh, we can we can collect. Great, and we've got a few more things that have come in. So when I kind of asked about who is who would use some of these things, um, it says I, Wendy Stein, and Phil Freeman worked with you, Monica, many years ago on a seven-acre field yeah. <laughs> and uh, to control leafy spurge with beetles, and they appreciated your help and they saw improvement. So kind of nice to hear. Great. Yeah. Um, it and we are always looking for really large infestations that will be in sectorate sites. So um, if somebody tells me that they have 50 acres of spurge, I am the only person who's really happy about that, but I am thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so can you describe the differences between a disturbed site and undisturbed spotted knapweed or spurge site? I take it all roadsides are disturbed. What about something like pastures? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, with pastures, we found biocontrol has worked pretty well with a low stocking rate. So again, trying to minimize, um, trying to minimize what, uh, I've seen this work in cattle pastures. I've also seen it work in buffalo pastures, which is really, or bison, I guess, um, really quite different as far as the pasture and what's in it. The bison pasture was really, really uh, diverse with the number of plant species, but oftentimes in a pasture um, with like brome grass or some other grasses, uh, if there's a low stocking rate, then um, biocontrol has been effective. With um, other sites, roadsides, um, we have done some biocontrol on roadsides in areas where there isn't mowing and spraying. And so that can take a lot of communication because there are a lot of different people who are out there working on roadsides. And so you don't want the roadside hate, you don't want mowing, you don't want spraying. So we've decided that center divides are just off limits for biocontrol altogether. Sometimes we do releases, um, you know, away from away from the road enough to where we can get establishment. So that can work in the photo. Um, the, there was knapweed right up next to the road and there wasn't knapweed extending into the, the uh, forested area. So in that case, all of the knapweed was right on the roadside and was more likely to be mowed or some other disturbance factor. 
Um, did I answer that question sufficiently about disturbance? You can let us know if not. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the difficulties of not being in person is, you know, yeah. hearing the follow up questions. Absolutely. Well, he still has a chance to throw something in there, but we've got a short question here. Ballpark, um, how many napweed release sites are there in Hubbard County? Oh, gosh, <laughs> that's that's it. You know, uh, it can be you can look in ed maps and see i don't know off the top of my head there certainly have been some some release sites we even had some research plots at conshock field um, in park rapids and there have been a number of other release locations on private land and i think mindot's done some releases right near the beltrami county border along highway two but I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head how many releases there have been. Problem. There have been more releases in Beltrami. So I've got one more here right now that says, um, have you experienced any issues with beetles collected in the southern part of the state not surviving if released in the far northern part of the state? We have not. There have been some researchers who um, have been looking at local adaptation of bioagent populations with this idea that you do a release and those that survive um, you know are able to obviously live in that area and that might contribute to a, a lag time for establishment that um, you know not all of the beetles might make it so there might be something of a lag i i couldn't say for sure um, but in general, we have had no problems. And a lot of the napweed agents that we collect are from um, areas like Bemidji where it's pretty cold. And so I tell you, those are like the toughest bio agents you'll ever find. And we can release them anywhere and they'll, they'll do fine. They're um, very hardy. Perfect. So, um... I just dropped the request for continuing ed credits in the chat. Uh, again, please try to get those in today. I try to get those done um, day of. So uh, if you don't get your request in today, um, I might miss it and you might see kind of a, a lag in getting your credits. Um, so please try to get those in today. Um, and I don't have any other questions right now, but I just wanna say thank you so much to Sasha and Monica. That was really great. And I'm so glad there was so much time for questions because there were lots of them and they were great. So I also thank all of our participants here today uh, for asking those. Um, still have another minute if something comes in, but otherwise I'll just say thank you. And uh, we'll hope to see everybody next month. Thanks everybody for the great questions and DNR foresters, feel free to drop me an email if you want to talk more about biocontrol or have some good sites. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Again, the good questions really helped um, helped us to better explain biocontrol. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll include um, most of the links. I'll try to get all of them that were mentioned with the recording so that folks, you know, if you missed something that was mentioned, you can follow up with those there. And uh, I hope that everybody has a great rest of their day. See you next time.